So starting now, um, hi, just wanna uh, thank the Animals and Society Institute um, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, kind of unusual for an entomologist to speak to a group about human animal studies because uh, a lot of people don't even recognize that insects are animals. But in fact, there's big emphasis on companion animals in the studies of human animal interactions. And as I'd like to explain today, um, ectoparasites are the ultimate companion animals. So companion animals can be defined as uh, those animals who share our homes and our lives. Uh, because we consider these animals to be family, they are family, companion animals enjoy more, more legal protections than other animals. Well, uh, over the course of human history, our closest companion animals have actually been the invertebrate ectoparasites that consume our, our blood and skin and other tissues. Uh, they're not legally recognized or legally protected, but in fact, dozens of species of arthropods share our lives and our homes and often our vertebrate companion animals. Uh, and there have been many, many interactions over the history of our species. And it's, it's worth taking a look. Um, now, universal disgust toward human ectoparasites is a relatively new attitude that ectoparasites could act as disease vectors um, uh, and were thereby responsible for massive losses of human life is a relatively new concept, uh, only dating back about 125 years. Uh, fleas, for example, are notorious today for being vectors or carriers of Yersinia pestis, the pathogen that causes bubonic plague. Uh, they also are less well known, but no less guilty of serving as vectors of Rickettsia typhi, the pathogen that uh, causes murine typhus in humans, uh, Bartonella hensley, which is the pathogen that causes catch, scratch fever, and also uh, Dipolidium canin caninum, which is the dog tapeworm, which occasionally infests humans. Now, just, just for the story of uh, the role of fleas in plague transmission, uh, took place um, more than a, a decade, required a de more than a decade of research and occurred over hundred years ago. Uh, in 1894, uh, Yers Alexander Yersin in Bombay in Shibasaburo Kitasato of Japan almost simultaneously described the bacterium Yersinia pestis in victims of plague. Nine years after that, uh, British entomologist Charles Rothschild uh, was the uh, first to describe the species of flea that turned out to be the principal plague vector, the oriental rat flea, Xenopsila uh, chiopis. That was in 1903. And in between, a French physician, Paul Louis Simon, working in Pakistan, demonstrated that flea bites were important in plague transmission. And he completed the life cycle um, of plague transmission by finding the plague bacilli themselves in the guts of fleas. So the facts were all there, but in fact, the idea seemed so implausible that it wasn't widely accepted for at least a decade. And the only precedent at the time, and the reason for the reluctance to believe it, is that mosquito trans transmission of malaria, the only other example uh, known of insect-borne diseases of human pathogens, uh, wasn't demonstrated until 1897. And uh, the fact that we've been oblivious to this uh, association that we have bet uh, between arthropod vectors and uh, human health uh, is, uh, ignores the fact that we have been objects of uh, selection pressure, evolutionary uh, selection pressure from ectoparasites that may be responsible for making us human. Um, the, in other words, evolving the traits that differentiate humans from other primates. Uh, these include upright posture, lack of body hair, opposable thumbs for grooming others, um, not yourselves, uh, big brains in the formation of social groups. It's been postulated, here's one particular scenario, that uh, when we differentiated from primates, one path in uh, responding to pressure, suction pressure from ticks uh, led to a selective advantage for primate ancestors that lacked body hair. Now, the, the advantage is you are uh, better able to detect and remove parasites. The disadvantage is there's no hair for your offspring to cling to. So those individuals ended up um, having uh, to evolve different mechanisms for, for carrying their babies, which in, increased uh, act, being active on the ground rather than living in trees because you don't want to drop your baby. 
than adaptations for terrestrial carrying behavior, which was facilitated by straight-legged terrestrial bipedalism, which is human. So much of what makes us human may be the responsible of having been uh, parasitized by so many different arthropods over our history. In terms of our cultural history around the world and throughout history, religious fe fe figures seem to have a special uh, uh, relationship with uh, ectoparasites and actually gain admiration uh, for that from their uh, co-religionists. Uh, for example, um, Pagor Veratsana was a, a Buddhist hero during the imperial period of Tibet, about 800 uh, BCE, and was considered to be a reincarnation of an Indian pandita or a scholar who had mastered all five sciences. Now, depending on the translation of the original Tibetan, um, Veratsana might have had a beard infested with lice. One such early writing is translated as meaning among Veratsana's whiskers, miniature wrathful deities of the size of mustard seeds were appearing and amassing. And they so much terrified the opponent that he abruptly rose leaving Veratsana behind. So um, the question remains, did Veratsana have lice? Uh, then jumping ahead some centuries, the story of Thomas a Becket uh, is probably familiar to most. He was Archbishop of Canterbury, and he was martyred uh, when he was ordered by uh, murdered by order of Henry II, and subsequently venerated as a saint. And some of his saintliness uh, was revealed at the time of his uh, um, his murder. Uh, so the he was murdered in the cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral. He lay in the cathedral, and when he was prepared for bur burial, uh, he was. Uh, um, undressed and discovered to have extraordinary number of layers of clothing and closest to the skin was an unusual hair shirt that was covered with linen. And as his body grew cold, as one account uh, reported, the vermin that were living in this multiple covering started to crawl out. And as uh, a chronicler described, the vermin boiled over like water in a simmering cauldron and the onlookers burst into alternate weeping and laughter at the sight of, of such a saintly man putting up with all those lights. Now, St. Louis of Toulouse in the 13th century, um, uh, was born of royal blood, but he renounced his inheritance and dedicated his rather short life to serving the poor, neglecting his own physical needs to the extent that he, quote, rejoiced to find a flea in his habit and, quote, abhorred materialism, according to Toynbee of uh, St. Louis of uh, Toulouse. Uh, then there was uh, St. Benedict Joseph Labra, the patron saint of lice, also pretty short-lived, and about whom not much seems to have been written, but he was associated with lice, which in uh, some views as in Holiness in Action, volume 98, uh, one author described that by not washing and allowing lice to flourish undisturbed on his hairy skin, brought home quite clearly to his contemporaries of the 18th century that all, no matter what their rank or wealth, uh, were all vulnerable to the, uh, uh, the uh, um, insults of, of uh, ectoparasitism. Although another account says, we have to admit that the lice, the rags, and the general absence of hygiene do not coincide with our ideas of holiness. Uh, and there we stick with perhaps a puzzled shrug of, or devout thanks that God has not decreed that the straight and narrow way should be louse ridden for all of us. And St. Benedict, Benedict jo Joseph would probably be the first to agree. Now in secular life, before people were aware of the potential deadly consequences of consorting with fleas, their intimate association with humans, particularly of the human female variety, seemed to inspire amusement and voyeuristic thoughts among men on many, in many countries throughout Europe, at least as reflected by an entire genre of literature called flea literature, or in German, flow literatur. Now, the oldest example of the genre is the story von den Ritten and von der Flo, The Fever and the Flea, written about 1300, uh, 1320, by a Bernese uh, friar named Ulrich Boner. One of the many parables published in a volume called Der Edelstein, which was penned to evil, illuminate the evils and errors of the world. Uh, one historian wrote about this collection, uh, to what lengths of realistic frankness, not to say coarseness, the 14th century would go in its protest against chivalric convention was exemplified by this tale describing the intimate experiences of a flea and a fever alternately visiting an abbess in a convent and a working woman scrubbing linens in a washtub. 
Now the flea motif enjoyed considerable popularity for humorous and satiric writing due to the sharp contrast of the flea's biological significance as an irritating parasite and with its sim symbolic significance as a sexual go-between politician and oddly enough scholar. One early influential contribution to flea literature was jo Johann Fischart's Flohas Weibachtas, which appeared in 1573. In satiric fashion, this work revolves around a flea's complaint of rough treatment by women and the response of women who justify their actions against the fleas, written in very militaristic terms in some cases. Now, erotic flea poetry really took off in the late 16th century in France, helped by etymology. The French word for flea, pousse, shares a linguistic progenitor with pousselle, maiden, pousselage, maidenhead, and de pousselle, which is to deflower. In fact, the expression avoir de la pousse de la l'oreille, to have a flea in one's ear, today mean, is used to mean a rebuke or a buff, but in medieval France, it meant to experience a sexual urge. And that's the sense in, in which uh, um, Jean de La Fontaine in his um, tales uh, uh, utilized it uh, in, in the line here. The girl who thinks of her missing uh, lover um, throughout the night, one says, has a flea in her ear, sexual desire. The Flea, a poem by John Donne, uh, published posthumously in 1633, has become, despite its obvious erotic content, a staple of high school English classes. Like so many men before him, Donne recognized the metaphorical significance of a flea consuming the blood of both the male suitor and his reluctant female partner, and that he could use uh, this intermingling of blood uh, to convince his reluctant female partner to uh, yield to his entreaties. So you see in uh, the second verse here, um, oh, oh stay three lives and one flea spare, where we almost, nay, more than married are. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed, uh, and marriage temple is. Uh, Though use make you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder added be, and sacrilege three sins in killing threes. Um, for the record, uh, spoiler alert, um, she does refuse him and she ends up killing the flea. Anyway, so flea-related sexual hijinks continued to appear in literature into the late 18th century as exemplified by Francis Burney's 1785 novel titled Memoirs and Adventures of a Flea, uh, in which are interspersed many humorous characters and anecdotes in two volumes. So that the novel is narrated by a female flea and thus is representative of the English genre called it narrative, uh, which is an autobiographical story narrated by a non-human. The unnamed flea introduces the reader to a succession of her human hosts who span all ranks of British society. Along with social critique are explicit, explicit es sexual escapades of both human and insect varieties, as well as uh, crude humor, often at the expense of the upper classes and parasitic politicians. This involves sexual adventures, buttocks, urine, flatulence, and excrement. This entomological literary tradition persisted through the 19th century with the novel, The Autobiograph Autobiography of a Flea, which was published in 1887 anonymously, but eventually revealed to be, have, have been written by an, um, a, a lawyer in London, Stanislaus de Rhodes. The novel's plot revolves around a young innocent maiden, her swain, her uncle, 19 priests, and a startling variety of sexual encounters. Since its appearance more than 130 years ago, the books have continued to find new audiences, and has been reprinted at least eight times. And in 1976, it was made into an X-rated movie with the same name. It is available on Amazon. Now, throughout this period, male painters joined poets across Europe in drawing inspiration from female flea hunts and the shedding of all clothing that they seemed to require. Artists representing this genre included Dutch Golden Age painter, Gerrit von Hunthorst, whose painting uh, called The Flea Hunt thanks to 1621, his uh, compatriot Andries Both, hunting by candlelight, flea hunting by candlelight from 1630, and uh, the Dutch painter Dirk Hollis, whose 1636 uh, painting called Touch uh, depicts a young girl removing fleas from her blouse. Uh, there was also in France, Baroque painter Georges de la Tour with his 1630, The Flea Catcher, right here, and his, his compatriot, the French Rococo painter, um, uh, Nicolas uh, Lancre, who painted La Chercheuse uh, de Puce, the, the, the flea hunter. Um, from Italy, Giuseppe Maria Crespi picked up this gauntlet with his painting, La Pulse, or The Flea Hunt in 1720. 
Here's Crespi's painting. Although these works span more than a century uh, and differed in such features as lighting, color, and composition, just about all of them had in common bared female bosoms. Female flea hunts inspired, inspired art uh, into the 20th century in the form of naughty French postcards. Uh, these featured semi-clad women still after so many centuries searching for fleas by removing all their clothing. These, by the way, are available on eBay. Now, artifacts exemplified by flea traps of the 16th through 19th century also illustrated the unique relationship between people and fleas. These ostensibly functional devices were constructed uh, and intended to lure and trap fleas when they were worn on the body. But ultimately, uh, they became fashion accessories uh, and uh, displayed re remarkable um, attention to detail and uh, considerable craftsmanship. The 18th century fascination with the erotic association between women and fleas spilled over into the decorative arts uh, in the form of a special device called a flea leg, which was used for tamping down tobacco in pipes. A flea leg is a porcelain object shaped to resemble a lady's leg painted with a stocking, garter belt, and bow, and bedecked with a few painted fleas, usually on the thigh. Uh, so these are uh, specimens that span Europe, uh, often are, are housed in uh, uh, medical museums. Also during this period, dress fleas uh, became popular. Um, pulgas vestidas, this was a popular form of folk art in Mexico. Um, and uh, they are often exhibited in, in museums. Here from the Tring Museum in um, just outside London, here's a magnifying um, glass through which you can see the tiny dress fleas. Uh, most popular uh, scenarios of which were typically um, weddings with a, a, a bride and groom. Um, very tiny um, and uh, not appreciated by all artists. Uh, so uh, they, they were folk art, they were sold uh, to tourists in, in particular, uh, but Octavio Paz was a diplomat, a poet, a writer and winner of the 1990 Nobel Prize in Literature was un, unimpressed and actually um, called uh, the production of dress fleas a difficult art, exquisite and useless. Um, and continued, I shall never be one to disparage this amazing skill since where spiritual health is concerned, building a size skyscraper and adorning a flea are each as monstrous as the other. Um, and, and there are people who still create uh, dressed fleas, including Tim Cockrell, who has an interest in uh, fleas and flea circuses. And uh, um, as you can see in uh, his Wikipedia entry, just earlier in this year, in 2021, he exhibited a flea circus at the Virtual Insect Fear Film Festival at the University of Illinois. Okay, what seems to have endeared people to flee, fleas to people over the centuries was the jumping thing. Fleas can jump up to heights of 12 inches, 150 times their own height. Energy is stored in a pad in a leg segment that's composed of a stretchy protein called resilient. The resilient pad releases stored energy and extends the leg much uh, more rapidly than a muscle contraction could, sort of in the way that a stretch rubber band will snap back with great force. Uh, another feature that makes um, fleas see, seem to be exceptional is the surface area volume ratio. That impressed people with what they perceived to be the remarkable strength of tiny fleas, which lead to the contemporary ca uh, calculations interpreting that strength, strength as the ability to pull up to 160,000 times their own body weight, the same as a human pulling over 2,600 double-decker buses. Uh, these are often on websites called Amazing Facts About Fleas and the like. Because they're so small, um, scientific studies of fleas were few and far between until magnifying devices were available. In his landmark 1665 book, Micrographia, British scientist Robert Hooke was the first person to produce an image of a magnified flea using four fold-out pages to capture all the minute details. Uh, his admiration of the flea is evident uh, in the text describing what he saw, all over adorned with a curiously polished suit of sable armor neatly jointed, continuing very plainly manifested such as no other creature I have yet observed has anything like it. Dutch microscopist Antony van Leeuwenhoek was similarly impressed by flea morphology. In his letter to a, a written in 1693 to the Royal Society and subsequently published in a journal, he created a drawing depicting the morphology of the human flea about which he remarked, 
since we see them so plainly that the flea is endowed with as great perfection in its kind as any large animal, all whose limbs can be seen with the naked eye. He was similarly impressed with its jumping prowess, writing, now if we reflect on this wonderful and complicated formation of joints in a flea's leg, we shall cease wondering that it can leap to so great a height as we see. Oliver Goldsmith's history um, of the earth and, um, and animated nature was first published in 1774 recognized that fleas were the enemy of mankind. He had a separate chapter devoted to fleas, um, separate from insects in general and insects with wings, uh, where he acknowledged the bloodthirsty disposition of the flea um, uh, makes it the enemy of mankind, as well as the dog, cat, and several other animals. But he concludes his section on fleas by saying these animals are endued with a degree of strength for their size that at first might exceed credibility. Had man an equal degree of strength bulk for bulk with a louse or flea, the history of Samson would no longer be in miraculous. A flea will draw whoops, uh, a chain a hundred times heavier than itself and to compensate for this force will eat 10 times its own size of provision in a single day. Even the eminent British entomologist William Kirby who wrote the first entomology textbook in 1815, Introduction to Entomology or Elements of the Natural History of Insects, remarked very unscientifically, don't you like fleas? Well, I think they're the prettiest little merry things in the world. I never saw a dull flea in all my life. Once revealed by magnification, the intricate morphology of fleas provided an inspiration and challenge to artists and craftsmen. In 1578, watchmaker Mark Scaliot is thought to have been the first craftsman to use fleas to demonstrate his skills by equipping a flea with a tiny chain and a tiny lock that contains 11 separate tiny pieces. The popularity of these flea-based miniatures increased as microscopes became more widely available to the general public. And the, these uh, displays of these miniatures actually became um, public attractions for which uh, one paid an admission price here in this example of one shilling to see things um, uh, like uh, a Lando, which opens and shuts by springs, hanging on braces uh, with four persons they're in, two foot, footmen, a coachman on the uh, box with a dog between his legs, six horses and a postillion all drawn by a single flea. Now, the combination of flea behavior and human craftsmanship led to the creation of the flea circus, credited to entrepreneur Louis Bertolotto, who began in the 1820s, uh, beginning in the 1820s, presented an extraordinary exhibition of industrious fleas on Regent Street in London, which proved to be an immediate and durable attraction. Initially, the human flea, Pulex irritans, was a species of choice in flea circuses because of its large size. It can be seen by a larger crowd. Here's a, a flyer illustrating the... Um, um, uh, a flea circus put on by Bertolotto featuring a mail coach ballroom and uh, most spectacularly um, the uh, uh, a reenactment of Napoleon's defeat at Water Waterloo featuring the three heroes, the Duke of Wellington, Napoleon Bonaparte and Prince Blucher riding on fleas with gold saddles and etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, flea Circuses proliferated throughout the 20th century with cat fleas, Tinus phallides felis, replacing the human flea, which had, by that point had been become actually rather rare. Uh, one of the most famous of these flea circuses was in Times Squares, was there for many years, uh, was run by um, Roy Heckler, uh, who got some newspaper attention in 1946 when he claimed that his fleas uh, wanted to have a union election and that wanted to be represented. See, you can see here, um, we want a union. Heckler, uh, he Heckler's fleas. So in the newspaper article, majority vote may make the members of the amusement clerks and concessionaires, employees, union, local 1115C, retail clerks, International Protective Association. So here you see Heckler um, uh, and the fleas here on the whiteboard, um, uh, keeping a close watch. Um, the, flea rep uh, the, um, the flea representatives are here casting their votes under these watchful eyes. So flea circuses today can um, memorialize in museum resistance uh, exhibits such as in Baraboo, Wisconsin and Circus World where there's a flea circus exhibit uh, and by active flea circuses. There are, there are a handful of people who make a living touring the country and the world uh, with their performing fleas. People today are still amused by the concept of fleas in board games, including those that reference flea circuses, in video games, some of which um, uh, reimagine um, digital flea circuses and others of which um, 
create a whole new uh, virtual world for flea performing fleas. Um, stuffed animals that are cat toys uh, here, dog toys, um, uh, other pet toys, um, patterns for crocheting, and even uh, promotional objects for in pesticide manufacturers. Now, as new forms of artistic expression evolved, fleas continued to feature early and prominently. Uh, for example, in, in moving pictures uh, in cinema, um, fleas began almost at the, as, uh, at the moment that, that uh, movies began, um, right after the turn of the century. Uh, the first, the oldest flea movie is a short live action called The Troublesome Flea. It was released in 1906, uh, depicting kind of a classic tale on evening reception. One of the guests is attacked by this unpleasant little insect and out of sheer annoyance, removes his nether garments in an adjoining room. Unfortunately, they fall out the window. Other guests bursting in the room, finding in, him in this dilemma, chase him into the street, runs full tilt into a policeman who likewise gives chase into the country up a tree where the guest removes the policeman's trousers and tries to put them on instead. Um, uh, the first animated flea uh, uh, film, as far as I know, is Bobby Bump's Pup Gets the Flea Enza in 1919. Uh, according to IMDb, Bobby Bump's and his dog Fido appeared in multiple animated films, the first to be created using cell animation. They were all often on timely subjects. The most timely in 1919 was about the Spanish flu pandemic, which was in full tilt in 1919. And, and with, in this movie, Bobby and Fido, um, his dog, uh, figure out that the uh, the uh, in flea, the fleenza is caused by fleas. A little animated fleas. Bobby Bumps gets fleenza, um, and the very first scene, the movie, the film opens with Fido appearing wearing a mask in 1919. So mid-century Warner Brothers animators had a penchant for puns and fleas. Trend has carried on, uh, has continued carried on by other animators. You can just see a few examples from Warner Brothers and Itch and Time, and here is uh, uh, the Blue Plate special um, where uh, a flea uh, is uh, um, going to work on both uh, these hosts. A horsefly flees, what price fleetum to itch his own, uh, flee for your life and starting from scratch. Uh, and 21st century anime has continued with the tradition uh, with fewer puns, although I'm not fluent in Japanese, so maybe there are more puns than I, I know of. But there are uh, entire uh, uh, storylines that revolve around flea characters, including Miyoga, a male flea yokai, and uh, uh, among other flea yokai, tiny cartoonish demons that share certain characteristics with fleas, the, small, the smallest beings that belong to the demon world. A number of others uh, uh, animes uh, feature uh, flea or characters, fleas or characters inspired by fleas. So I guess in conclusion, we really have to face the facts that according to recent molecular studies of uh, class insecta, where the ancestry of, of fleas could be nailed down, it's clear that fleas have been sucking vertebrate blood for almost 300 million years and sucking human blood for as long as our species has been in existence. It's likely they will be influencing us for the foreseeable future in ways we can well imagine and in other ways we can't even begin to imagine. So with that, thank you so much. Um, and uh, um, I, <laughs> I hope you think about um, what I've said next time uh, you kill whatever fleas you find on your pet with my blessing. Thank you. <laughs>